So hello everybody, it's a big honor to me to be here with Michael Yako, which is one of the uh, most important brief therapists and hypnotherapists which conducted uh, studies and intervention about hypnosis. It's a pleasure to me to having uh, you here, Michael. Thank you for accepting to do this interview. My pleasure, thank you. And so, if you're ready, we can start. Okay. So, uh, I just want to start having a very little um, idea about brief therapy, the state of art in brief therapy and depression. What we know today about this problem and about the way of brief therapy to do useful in treating depression. Well, depression is a global shorthand for a, a pretty wide variety of symptoms and patterns that all contribute to the experience. And so regardless of whether someone's therapy is short term or longer term, depending how severe the depression is, how complicated the depression is, regardless, Every depression expert would agree that treatment needs to be as active as possible. And this is, of course, the overlap with brief therapy approaches. One of the things to appreciate about brief therapy is that it defines the relationship as an active one, that the therapist is not hesitating to direct the course of therapy to achieve particular outcomes. In the context of treating depression, we're often having to help people develop particular skills that will help them overcome depression. So those skills might be coping skills, they might be problem solving skills, they could be social skills, they could be all of those things and more. And so the idea of course, isn't that you're just limiting yourself to to a specific number of sessions, but it's more an attitude of every session moving the person closer to getting better, every session having a purpose and a direction to it, and this is what brief therapy is about, therapy with direction. This is very, very interesting because um, you talk, you talk a lot about to be, uh, if I understand, to be uh, direct with, with the client, to um, say to the client to do a specific task. And uh, uh, this, uh, uh, this helped me to remember a thing that uh, you told me before, uh, many years ago, when we do a first interview for uh, another website I have. And uh, you talk about the language of change. Um, I remember you talk about uh, Paul Václavík, The Language of Change, his book, and you say that that's probably a book that every therapist should read. So um, I'm thinking about the communication, the language. Uh, how is the language with a depression, with, with a depressed patient? Uh, in, in which way a therapist must communicate with a depressed patient? Well, one of the things about depression is it takes away people's hope and motivation out of the belief that nothing can really change. If depression was a commercial product, its advertising slogan would be, why bother? Why bother to go for therapy? Why bother to do the homework assignments that my therapist gives me? Why bother to read the books they recommend? Why bother to do anything? And so it's a really vitally important part of the process from the very beginning that the therapist is using the language of hope, that there's building an expectation that effort will pay off. And so the language is critically important as a vehicle for getting the idea across that if you take the time to learn something about your vulnerabilities to depression, if you take the time to learn the kinds of skills that will help reduce 
your risk factors for depression if you take the time to learn these things and participate in therapy you can expect to get better well you think about all the different ways that the language of therapy sometimes works against people developing positive expectations and we use language like somebody is an abuse survivor or we tell people your problem is biochemical or we tell people your problem is genetic the kinds of things that continue to take away the motivation to even try if i tell you your problem is genetic does that inspire you to want to do anything about it or does it make you feel like a victim of your genes and so in particular with depression where expectancy is such a critical factor not only in the response to psychotherapy but also in response to antidepressant medications this is one of the interesting findings in the research over the years that the people who have the most positive expectations for positive results are the ones who are the most responsive to antidepressants and so even a drug response is dramatically influenced by a person's quality of expectations and so the art for a brief therapist is how do i build positive expectations of change as quickly as possible this happens to be one of the reasons why i am such a strong advocate for the use of hypnosis treatment that when somebody comes in and feels hopeless if they even come in for treatment which is unfortunately not as frequent as we would like only about 20 to 25 to percent of depression sufferers will actively seek help from a mental health professional the majority of people don't because of their hopelessness but that first session becomes a very very important thing now as you know very often the first session is the only session and how important it is how you construct that first session to help the person discover that their problems are changeable their symptoms are malleable and hypnosis is perfect for that reason because if you do a hypnosis session even in the first session the person's body changes as their body relaxes their blood pressure goes down their muscles relax the person experiences physical changes the person's ruminations will slow down and stop the person experiences cognitive changes so that you're not just intellectually talking about the possibility of change you're demonstrating to the person that things can change and that is a very important beginning to building positive expectations for treatment um as you say it's very important to um in a way to be active in another way to consider that the first session the, the first uh, session could be the last session the only session that, that you have and um it's it's interesting to thinking about what is the the most important key to use in depression you 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 wrote a book is if i remember the title is um key for depression key keys for solution in depression i've actually yeah i've actually written 15 books and many of them yeah, are yeah, about yeah. Uh, treating depression the one you're referring to keys to unlocking depression is It's one of my most recent ones yeah but you know, the the point about the first session might be the only session you know that is statistically the most common yeah. that people will come in for one session and then they won't come back and so you know if a therapist uses that whole first session to just ask about the patient's history they're missing the chance to do something that will bring the person back by demonstrating to them that therapy can produce changes and can produce changes quickly that's one of the great advantages of knowing hypnosis yeah. and 
you know, as I, I travel around the world doing hypnosis trainings for that reason, to help people acquire those skills, because that is such an important part of a first session with any client, but especially with depressed clients. And if you have to, in that book, you talk about, uh, if I remember well, uh, 12 different key to unlock depression. If you have to suggest, you, you did um, lecture in over than 30 countries. So if you have to think about one of those key to suggest to therapists, uh, which one is the, the most precious if you have just one key to choose for help the client you have in front of you with depression. I think the, the most important key is the one I've mentioned, positive expectancy. Positive expectancy. That, that if the person doesn't have positive expectations for treatment, then nothing else matters anyway, mm -hmm. because they won't be coming back and they won't be participating in the therapy. But there, there are a number of other patterns, and it's hard to really say um, which one is the most important because it's different from one client to the next. Yeah. One client needs a lot of help learning how to tolerate ambiguity. One of the things that we know from research is that depressed people don't handle ambiguity in the same way that people who are not vulnerable to depression. And by ambiguity, I mean we face situations, all of us, every day where we have to make decisions about what we're going to do, even though we don't have facts to guide us. Mm. You know, should I call this person or shouldn't I call this person? Should I apply for this job or shouldn't I apply for this job? You know, we, we have to make decisions in the face of uncertainty and with depressed people, uncertainty invites negative projections. The person anticipates the worst, which is part of what keeps them from taking positive action. So for some people, it's about ambiguity. For other people, it's about their perceptions of controllability. The person doesn't believe that anything in their life can be controlled, so why should they try? You know, why should they go to school? They'll never be able to finish anyway. It's not in their control. Why should they take a job? They're never going to succeed anyway. It's out of their control. And so perceptions of controllability will be an issue for some people. And so when we look at all the different kinds of patterns, it includes things like low frustration tolerance. The person will try something to help themselves. And if they don't have instant success, they give up. Yeah. Uh, and another very important pattern is called the internal orientation, where the person uses their feelings as the indicator of what to do. And the problem, of course, is when your feelings are depressed, you're very likely to make depressed decisions. And part of what we know is that depressed people tend to make bad decisions that make their depression worse. So. You know, there are many different patterns and which patterns to focus on will be different from one depressed person yeah. to another. There, there's no formula. There's no one correct way to treat depression. In fact, it seems to me that uh, sometimes insist uh, on, on um, how to say, on, on a protocol, on a therapeutic protocol could be a bad decision for, for a therapist because in that way you are treating the diagnosis, not the client, not the person. Exactly. Yeah, you're not exactly. helping. Exactly person. right. You know, we don't treat diagnostic labels, we treat people. And every person we treat, whatever problems they have, they still have skills, they still have resources, they still have things that we can use to help them get better, and not just feel better, but actually be better. It's, uh, it's, it's difficult with, um, often it's difficult with a, a depressed person to help, help her to see um, her resources, uh, 
um, resources, scale, strengths, because um, those cli oh, clients often say, uh, no, I'm, I'm not good, I can't do anything, I'm such a bad person, you know, I'm, I'm too depressed. So, um, uh, how, how can you manage that? How can you uh, help client to actually see their, their resource and their strengths? Well, one of the things that we know from all of the research in cognitive neuroscience and affective neuroscience is that if there is such a thing as a typical depressed person, they have what's called a global cognitive style. The, the person tends to think in over general terms. So they'll, they'll take a past failure and say, see, I failed, I can't do this. Or, you know, they suffer a disappointment. They say, so, you know, this never works. Why should I try? Here again is the positive expectancy being a part of it. But more important, it's the therapist's job to help this person get from this global thinking into something much more specific. Mm -hmm. And so how you structure the treatment and how you train the client to go from general to specific so let me give you an example. Clients walk in and they sit down and they say things like, all I want is to be happy. And if you ask, well, what exactly do you mean by that? What do you mean by happy? They look at you like, what's wrong with you that you don't know what that means? But then I'll say, okay, let's talk about something that you know how to do. Pick something you know how to do, anything that you feel confident you know how to do. Do you know how to get dressed? Do you know how to go grocery shopping? Do you know how to drive a car? Do you know how to take a shower? And the person will say, well, of course I know how to do those things. I'll say, okay, fine. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to create a, a sequence in writing that somebody who doesn't know how to do this could follow your sequence and succeed. So I want you to create a sequence for how to take a shower so that anybody could follow it and successfully take a shower. They bring that back to me a week later and they'll have three steps. Get wet, soap up, rinse off. And I'll say, well, wait a second. How did this person find the shower? How did this person know how to turn the light on? How did this person know how to turn the water on? How did they know how to adjust the water temperature? And I'll start bringing in all of the specific of, of how there are many, many steps to taking a shower. Then I'll say, okay, now that we have taken all of these steps for taking a shower, now I want you to do the same thing for how to be happy. And that's the first time the person realizes they don't know what the steps are, and it's not that they don't deserve it, and it's not that they can't be, it's that they don't know what the steps are. So it's about training the person to start to think in terms of steps to follow. It's not about whether you believe it. It's not about whether you're in the mood for it. It's about, do you even know what to do? And what I find is that this has been one of the limitations of traditional psychotherapy. Traditional psychotherapy has focused on people's motivations analyzing people's motives. Why does the person feel this way? What are the secondary gains? What is the person afraid of? What is the person's unconscious need for self-sabotage or self-punishment? And analyzes all the motivations. And what I do instead is I focus on the abilities. Yeah. I, I believe the person wants to get better. Now the question is what skills are they gonna need in order to do that? And how do I make those skills learnable? And how do I help the person develop a willingness to experiment by working with these sequences to make good things happen? And that's how I get people connected to their resources. It isn't about your beliefs anymore. It's about what your abilities are. And I want to make sure the person has the actual abilities to do the things they want to do. This is a uh, a concept that I like very much. Um, it seems to me that it's also the, 
um, the leitmotif that you uh, talk about uh, in another book, the discriminating therapist. And in that book, uh, if I understood well, it's um, you insist a lot to um, how to say to go from a, a white therapist to a how therapist, from a therapist that um, want to know why, want to uh, to search the why of things, the why of uh, a problem, the why of depression, to a therapist that want to find the how, how does it work. And so, um, let's give a suggestion to uh, the therapists um, how to become a how therapist, a discriminating therapist. Mm -hmm. I, th I think it starts by recognizing that right now there are more than 500 diff different forms of psychotherapy, each di different assumptions, each with different techniques, very different viewpoints about why people have problems. And as soon as you ask why, you are inviting forming theories. And as soon as you start forming theories, is you're speculating, you're guessing, and whose guess is better than whose. It's why you have so many very sophisticated theories, but these sophisticated theories don't translate into practical psychotherapies very well. And so for me, when I wrote The Discriminating Therapist, I talked about the fact that I've been exposed to so many great theorists and their theories are very rich and very complex, and you can spend years studying the concepts and the language and all of those things, but those theories are not clients. Clients don't care about the theories. Clients just wanna get better as quickly as possible. And so the question became, would it be possible to develop a way of doing therapy that didn't involve some specific theory like psychoanalysis or cognitive therapy. And what I'm more interested in is, is how someone generates the symptoms they generate rather than trying to theorize about why. So I've been spending you know, much of my professional life de de developing this approach of sequencing, trying to understand what are the steps this person follows that generate the kinds of symptoms that they're having? How do they generate these symptoms? What do they focus on? What do they tell themselves? What are the steps that they go through that lead them into the kind of depression that they're experiencing? How, how not only uh, when, when I'm interviewing somebody, I'm really going down two paths at the same time I'm trying to identify what their skills are, what their resources are, how they're generating the symptoms and not using their skills. And the second line is, how do they work at staying the same? How do they go through life each day having new experiences, but nothing changes anything? How do they stay the same? So those questions have been very valuable in yeah. helping me identify quickly how this person generates their symptoms, what their what I call the experiential deficit is, what don't they know that's working against them, what do they know that isn't really so. And when I'm able to identify by asking the discriminating question, how do you know if it's this or if it's that? For example, how do you know if it's in your control or not? You assume it isn't, but how do you know? Yeah. And push the, person, push the person to say, I really don't know. And that's what opens up, well, then would you like to learn? Fantastic. And people say, yes. Or how do you know if you should be feeling guilty or not? How do you know whether you're responsible for this or not? How do you know whether you should hold on to this relationship or let go of it. How do you know? And these are what are called the discrimination criteria. What evidence the person uses, what, what available information does the person use to make a decision? And what I find over and over and over again is people make really bad decisions 
because they don't know how to decide reliably. That's fantastic. I, I really I really love that and I think that's the people who will see this video will really appreciate this. So Michael, I have a, a last question. Um, you know that in the in the psychotherapy in the last years the um, idea of the deliberate practice is going very well uh, so there are many authors that are saying that it's very important to uh, practice um, outside of the, the office uh, so not with the clients but um, practice the, um, the skills uh, outside in the in the war how to say so uh, you you do so much um, lessons, you do so much workshop around the world. Uh, we met for the very first time in person a few months ago at the Brief Therapy Conference. Um, so if you have to tell to psychologists, psychotherapists, and therapists in general to practice their, their skill, to do something, um, an exercise, a normal work, a task, to develop one single skill for treating um, clients with depression or for treating clients in general. Uh, what do you suggest? I think the single most important two things a therapist can learn to do and practice doing is learn how to be observant without interpreting the skill of observing without interpreting the mistakes that therapists make the differences between therapists is in the quality of the interpretations they make and, and the problem with therapists is they interpret things and then they believe interpretations so i think the most important skill somebody can develop relates to what i was talking about a little while ago when i was talking about how how people do things well yeah. What I'm what I'm aware of every day, inside therapy, outside therapy, is that there is a world filled with people who are really good at doing something, whatever it is. This is somebody who is really good at keeping their desk clean. Here's somebody who's really good at making people feel welcome in their home when they invite guests over. Here's somebody who's really good at at returning the email promptly. It doesn't matter to me what the skill is exactly, but I am intensely curious and I want to know how this person does what they do because those are the skills I'm going to need to teach somebody else. And you can't teach somebody what you don't know. You can't teach somebody what you don't know. So if you don't know how somebody is able to manage conflicts with skill, then how are you going to teach that to somebody when you start talking to them about the need to have better boundaries? Yeah. Or if, if you don't know how somebody develops greater self-awareness, then how are you going to teach that to somebody who needs greater self-awareness? So, you know, the, the idea isn't to me practice more therapy techniques because if you don't know how people do the things that they do well, then what are your therapy techniques going to be about anyway? You know, you, the, yeah. the, the whole idea is therapy is largely a process of guided discovery, helping people discover what they don't know that they can learn that will make a difference in their lives, what they can experience that will make a difference in their lives. And so for me, the insights come from looking at the world around me, seeing people in my world that are really good at doing things and learning from them and asking a thousand questions about how they do this and how they do that. And of course, this, this is what led me into one of the most fascinating projects of my entire life when I got invited into a program of working with elephant conservation and how to uh, train elephant trainers and keepers using my skills in sequencing and asking how questions to help trainers learn how to better work around elephants in a way that's safe. It was a really unique project and 
I tell the entire story on my website if somebody's interested in reading about it. Um, my website is yapko.com, Y-A-P-K-O.com. There's also a lot of information about depression and about hypnosis on the website as well. But the, the point I'm making is any therapist would need to be a curious person. Yeah. Any therapist would need to be able to recognize people who are skilled at something and know how to learn something about that person's skills in order to make it teachable to somebody else who really needs those skills. Yeah. yeah. This is a very precious, valuable suggestion. I suggest to hold the therapist to follow this suggestion and to go on your website uh, in which there are many news, many products, CD, DVD and uh, books. You, as you say, you wrote over than 15 books and uh, you travel the world. So if uh, you say Michael Yapko in your country, uh, last year you were here in Italy, um, that's good to see Michael because it's very, um, it, it's, it's very valuable to having a class with, with him. So, Michael. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Uh, I hope to see you soon here, here in Italy, also in our uh, post degree school in psychotherapy. You are one of the lecturers. And uh, thank you again for this interview and see you next time. Thank you so much, Flavio. Appreciate it. Take Bye. care. Take care. Bye.